The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. <laughs> That's a great way to begin a video. Hi, my name is Jeff Probst, and I'm an out. Uh, I'm teaching about uh, SSL today. Yes, back on track. Uh, today we're going to be beginning. Uh, we're going to be continuing our discussion about SSL. We're going to dive into some pretty amazing stuff. How to become your own certificate authority. Now I should. Uh, well, let's go over what we're going to be talking about. We have to understand this SSL tree of trust. Uh, intimately before we can understand what our role as certificate authorities are. So we're going to talk about that at length. We're going to dive back into the certificate format. Again, for those of you that were in the first presentation, it'll be a little bit of a rehash. But for those that have not been before, it'll be very informative to see what it looks like. Um, we have to cover some dirty work about configuration and some best practices when it comes to generating a certificate authority. And we have to talk about revocation lists. Finally, after we get through all of that, we'll be able to create our own certificate authority. That'd be pretty cool. So by the end of this presentation, hopefully you will be equipped with all the knowledge required to create, uh, sign, and destroy your own SSL certificates in whatever fashion you see fit. And I think that's pretty amazing. You can act like a big boy without being a big boy. Let's talk at first about some things some hard truths. What we're about to do is actually really hard. Um, we have to know how to operate the OpenSSL binary. We have to know the ins and outs of some of its configuration files. There will be a lot of fumbling around. It's kind of like your first time, only there's a lot of people here. <laughs> and you know, mistakes will be made, but that's OK. We'll get a chance to recreate our certificates. We'll find it doesn't work for some reason. In fact. I give about a 40% chance that what we create here today will actually work as it's supposed to. It's an iterative process to build your SSL certificates and your certificate authority. We will try to keep the swearing to a minimum because there are other people watching and we want to maintain a nice decor. So if you, if you need to swear, just kind of quietly go like this, swear to your neighbor, it'll be all good. Let's talk about trust. As a certificate authority, you are peddling trust. You are saying, I am this person, I am this organization, and I am trustworthy. You should put your trust in me because I am trustworthy. It's really built on hopes and dreams and wishes, at least to start. It's one of those things, it's like kicking a pebble down the top of a mountain that slowly gathers snow, and as it gets you know, more and more snow gathered, and then become an enormous organization like VeriSign. They're the, enormous house-sized snowballs that come rolling down the hill. But it starts with one little pebble at the top. It starts with one person or a couple people trusting you. Some of that trust is in that you're keeping your root and intermediate certificates secure. Um, we'll talk more about what those are later, but a big part of being a certificate authority is the fact that you are keeping these in a fashion such that they cannot be used by unauthorized parties, they can't be compromised by hackers or disgruntled employees or any number of things. This is really serious stuff we're talking about. Trust, I'm capitalizing it all throughout this presentation because trust is a really big deal when it comes to being a certificate authority. There's another part of this trust that says that if you sign someone else's certificate, that they're trustworthy. You are basically extending your cloak of trust and allowing them to come underneath so that when someone looks at them, they say, oh, that person has a certificate signed by this organization, and I trust that organization, therefore, I'm going to trust that person. When you do that, when you enlarge your cloak by one more signed certificate, you need to make sure that that individual, the organization for which you're signing, is reputable, that they're valid, that they exist, that you're not just creating some random, one-off certificate that'll be used to go attack something else. That's part of trust. And as a certificate authority, you have to maintain what are called revocation lists. Let's say you did trust someone improperly. You found out later that they were misusing your certificate, or they went out of business, or for whatever reason they wanted to cancel their certificate. 
you as a certificate authority have an obligation to maintain what's called a revocation list. It is all of your certificates that are issued and have been revoked. Were they not revoked, they would be valid at this moment in time. You have to maintain that. It has to be publicly available such that anyone who wants to go and check on person C's certificate can look at my revocation list and verify that certificate has not been revoked. Trust is really expensive. It's process, it's hardware, it's people, it's double and triple checking everything. It's very expensive, especially when you're selling trust to billion dollar organizations. They're going to demand the highest degree of security and trust. We're talking millions upon millions of dollars investing in vaults deep under the ground that have air gaps and uh, lasers and guards and smoke detectors or you know poison gas, anything you might come up with. Sharks, let's put some sharks in there, you know, just, you know. That's what we're talking about. Happy puppies, yes. <laughs> for those of you that were here for the last session, or we're not here for the last session, we created a uh, certificate for a fictional domain, happypuppies.com, suggested by my dad up here in the front. I don't know why happy puppies, but now it's become a theme. In fact, I think today we will be creating the Happy Puppies Certificate Authority. Let's talk about this tree. At the very top, we have the, the root certificate. And we talked at length about root certificates last presentation. A root certificate is very special. There is nothing above it. That's where I say, I am me, and I am trustworthy. That's the root certificate. The intermediate certificate is one level down. And the intermediate says, that person signed my certificate and has granted me authority to sign my own certificates. And you can do this as long as you want, as far as you want. You could have nine intermediates in a chain if you wished. It's very uncommon. There's nothing to stop you from doing it. You can also, as a, with the root certificate, you can sign a direct end user certificate. That's OK. It's uncommon. I think it would be very foolish to do so, because now you have to maintain that certificate. And you have to, every time you want to go maintain it, you have to walk through the sharks and the poison gas and the guards and the lasers and go work with your system that's got the root certificate on there. That's not fun. So what we tend to do is we create this highly secure root certificate. We sign it. It's us. It recognizes, our, it represents our trust. We then use that root certificate to sign intermediate signing certificates. Those are our workhorses. Those are going to be the ones that we're going to use to actually sign the end user certificates down at the very bottom of this tree. Well, we just discussed all of this. I'm getting ahead of myself. Ah, some important information about the root certificate is always self-signed. There is no other certificate above it. It is the root of this tree. And because it's really a pain in the butt to make this, we set up so it's valid for many years. I, I commonly see 20, 30 years in a root certificate. We can go and look at some of the root certificates for well-known vendors, and you'll see that they extend off to like 2034, 2030. No one really wants to go through this process multiple times. And so once you figure it out and you get it right and you get a successful certificate, you want to make sure you get it right and you don't have to do it for 20 years. So the root certificate is commonly protected by a hardware security mechanism and all the other joke things we talked about. The hardware security mechanism is no joke. They're very expensive. They're bespoke hardware for holding securely a certificate and its keys and allows you to interact with it in a secure fashion such that the key or in the certificate is never actually exposed. It's basically a little embedded device. Uh, hopefully you'd give it backup power. You'd give it you know, security and keys and everything. And you would go to that hardware security module, and you say, I need a new intermediate certificate. And it does it for you and gives you the result. You never touch the actual root certificate. It's like you never see the king. You may see the king's handlers. If you ever get to see the king, you're really special. So the part of this that's really important is, because we're not signing any end user certificates with the root, we're actually delegating all of our authority out to our intermediate certificates. That's a little scary. You have the same problem here with what happens if I have a disreputable client coming in asking for a client uh, a, a certificate. Only now, you may have accidentally given away the keys to your kingdom by allowing someone else to sign certificates in your name if you do your intermediate certificates wrong. So while you may not have the intermediate certificates as highly secured as your root, you're still very careful with them. 
what you issue, who you issue them to. You don't ever give an intermediate certificate to an end user. You just don't. Because then they don't need you anymore. And for as long as that intermediate certificate is valid, they can sign their own stuff as long as they want. We've been talking about intermediate certificates. There are workhorse certificates. They're the ones that, one step above the bottom of the tree, they sign the end user certificates. One root can have many. In fact, you can have as many intermediates as you like. Um, there is some upper limit on what is useful. How many intermediates do you need? At some point, you're going to be like, do I want the blue certificate or the red one today? Well, the blue would match my shoes, but the red goes really well with my eyes. I think I'll use the red one. You don't need to do that. You create intermediate certificates for individual purposes. Let's say I'm selling this particular product, this low security, low quality certificate over here for you know, cheap clients. We don't really care about them so much because they're cheap and they're not bringing us much revenue. And over here, we want this really high dollar platinum encrusted intermediate certificate for our IBM who's going to purchase them at $10,000 for a year of trust. You have different intermediate certificates for different needs. You give them different names. That way, you're spreading out your risk uh, as much as you need to. Now, you can spread it out too much. You can consolidate your risk. It depends upon what you want to set as your risk profile. And we're not going to go into that. That's a little too detailed. But if you do decide to do certificate authority, anything, one of the biggest steps is determining what your risk will be and how you're going to mitigate it. And it's very expensive. The intermediate certificates, like the root certificate, usually have many years of validity. Because again, you don't want to have to mess with reissuing it every year or every month or whatever you decide. Oh, that's a really great joke. If you have people that you're issuing certificates to just for fun, issue it for one day, give it to them. They won't notice. And they'll come back in two days and be like, what's wrong? It's really funny, let me tell you. I've never done that. <laughs> uh, an important fact of the intermediate certificates, they have to remain available. So the root certificate is buried deep in the earth. The intermediate certificates, they're still in a hardware security mechanism but they're out where they're actually able to be gotten to, which means that they have a higher risk profile. Someone is more likely to be able to get to them. A disgruntled employee is probably the most likely source of theft of an intermediate certificate. But it could be someone who breaks into the premises. It could be someone, maybe you have sloppy security policies and some hacker is able to get in without ever entering a physical premise. That could happen. So there is a risk associated with intermediates, but it's a better model than signing everything with just the root. Another problem with intermediates is because you're probably signing a lot of certificates with it, they're going to build up very large revocation lists. We're going to talk about the implications of that later. So the end user certificate, that's what most everybody here that's used a certificate is familiar with. It's just tiny little bit of trust coming from the big, very trustworthy root certificate on down to the intermediate who we also trust because he has authority for it. And that intermediate has granted me some tiny measure of trust for that one domain for a year. You'll be trusted. That'll be $99, please. It's a great business model. So we limit the risk by narrowing how long we're giving an end user certificate for and how many domains, what kind of certificate we're giving. Are we giving them a wild card? That could be more dangerous than just a regular. Are we putting 15 different subject alternate names on our certificate? That could be dangerous. When we sign a certificate, we need to very carefully read all of the information given to us by the client. It comes in the form of a certificate signing request. That information should be accurate. If you're signing things for other people, you probably should know who they are. If you're signing things and you don't know who they are, then you need to have some way of verifying that they are who they claim to be. I could claim to be Barack Obama, who's gone through an anti-tanning bed, and no one would know. But they would come along and check out and verify, hey, that guy doesn't really look right. That address is wrong. Let's check it. OK, that's not a valid certificate. We're not going to sign that. It's important to note, if you've signed a certificate and the owner of that certificate uses it to do bad things, you may or may not be legally liable, but you're certainly going to take a hit in trust. Again, I've capitalized trust. You're selling trust. This is the sole thing 
you are claiming to possess and you are parceling it out. So anything that minimizes the trust people have in you is very, very bad. I'm going to do your utmost to make sure you're not damaging that trust. So let's say someone does something bad. You need to revoke it. You can do so. You can unilaterally revoke someone's SSL certificate that you have issued. When you sign their certificate request, you actually keep a copy of the resulting certificate. You don't keep a copy of their key. You don't need that. You just need the certificate. You hang on to that. And then if they do something bad, you hear about it, or the time has expired, or they need to revoke it for whatever reason, you can issue a rev revocation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So let's talk about the certificate format. We looked at a certificate last presentation that was an end user certificate. Now we're going to switch gears and look at some of these root and intermediate certificates. So I'm going to hop over to here. Can this be seen by everybody? Okay, great. By the way, this, all these resources here are out on the web for you to play with at your leisure. You're not going to be able to do anything with them because there's no keys, but they could be useful for reference, looking at how I've done things. That, especially that configuration file, that root.cnf, that'll be invaluable for you later. So let's look at some of these certificates. Here we have a root certificate that I created late last night, around 11 p.m., 12 p.m., something like that. Time is hard. You'll note here about this line here at the very top is the issuer. I have created a, basically a fictional certificate authority for our conference here at Southeast Linux Fest. Going down a couple lines, you will see that the subject is exactly the same. This is a self-signed root certificate. In fact, all root certificates must be self-signed because that's what you're selling. Between those two pieces of information, we have the validity dates. I set this certificate authority to have a validity for 20 years because I really don't want to mess with this again. We have information. I apparently used a very small public key or key pair when I did this. So the uh, key pair for this certificate authority is only 512 bits, which is way too small. Don't use this for real. This was just for an example. Down here, we get into the extensions section, some very important parts. We're going to ignore the subject key identifier and the authority key identifier, except to note that both of those are exactly the same. This identifier is basically a very short thumbprint of what the certificate claims to be. And because the ID and the identifiers are the same, we can, also, we can tell that it's a self-signed certificate. Down here is where the magic happens. You guys cannot see that highlight. I apologize. Um, this basic constraints flag is crucial for us being able to operate as a certificate authority. If I can get that up towards the top. There we go. Ignore that junk at the bottom. We have a flag here that says CA of true. That means this certificate can be used as a certificate authority to sign other certificates. We also have another value called path lin. This is important because it limits the depth at which your tree of trust can go. Here I have designated that as a path length of one, only one child certificate authority can exist, or one layer of child certificate authority can exist underneath a certificate. I can have many child certificate authorities, but none of those certificate authorities may have their own children. What happens when we move down the next layer will say, for the intermediate, certificate authority flag is true, but path length is zero. And if you ever try to sign a new certificate authority child certificate underneath it, OpenSSL will give you an error. This is the way the root can protect itself against a rogue intermediate certificate signing away and doing, you know, if you are a trusted individual as a root, that's very valuable. An intermediate may try and go off and do his own thing. It's kind of like you're head knight going off and making war in another nation. You don't really want them doing that, you know? At the very bottom here, we see two other important pieces, the key usage. You can specify what items this uh, certificate and key can be used for. 
In this case, I have limited it to solely signing certificates and signing revocation lists. This particular root certificate cannot be used to sign an end user certificate. I have banned it. This can only be used to sign an intermediate certificate. I don't want there to ever be any end users next to my root certificate. There has to be some space, at least one jump. So let's look at CRT, here we go. This is the intermediate certificate authority that I created last night. It has an issuer of the root authority that we just looked at. Southeast Linux Fest root CA. It has a subject of Southeast Linux Fest intermediate singing CA. <laughs> We're not using these. Like I said, there's a very low chance you'll actually get a good working quality certificate authority set your first time out. So, oh look, I used an actually good strong key this time. This is a 2048-bit 20, key. That's, that's good. Here we see down at the bottom, again, we see the CA flag is true, but Pathlin is zero. I cannot set any more certificate authorities underneath this one. This is it. The only thing I can do is to sign uh, end user certificates. Okay, let's take a look real quick at the certificate signing request, because that's pretty interesting. Oops. So here, if you weren't, this is more for if you were not here in the first presentation. When you create a certificate, almost every time you start with a certificate signing request, unless you're making a self-signed cert. You create a request with all of your information in it. You pass this request over to the authority, which is doing the signing. They review it. They decide to sign it or not. They return the signed cert to you. And here, I have created a certificate signing request for the intermediate. I passed it over to the root. The root took one look at it and said, hey, I know that guy. That's good, and signed it. It was really late, and it was really funny to me when I made that joke last night. <laughs> We see, again, we specified that this uh, CA flag is true, path length is zero. This was in my certificate signing request. I have the option to either put it into the request or as the signing authority, I can forcibly add that information in at the signing stage from the root. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There we go, algorithm. Here we go. All those certificates are out on the web in a line that's been chopped off, I apologize. If you have a larger screen, larger than 1024 wide, you'll be able to see it. Uh, and at the bottom, it's a little cheat sheet for how to look at those commands. We're going to dive into the configuration. And I'm warning you, this is really ugly. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, it's just is. It's all over the place. The OpenSSL project grew very organically, and so things are just kind of thrown in here, and oh, we're going to make a v3 extensions item, we're going to throw that in, but then only in some parts, so don't throw it in over here, so now we need to flag up here, it's just, it's, it's everywhere. It's important to note, uh, there are major sections within the configuration file. Yes, question? Oh, SSL, do they strictly use Oh no. Um, the question was, for OpenSSL, do they strictly use SHA-1 for hashing? Um, you can specify whichever hashing algorithm you want. I think by default, the configuration file specifies SHA-1. This one's in SHA-256. I was feeling ornery when I did it. You can use MD5, but again, like I said last presentation, if you're using MD5 for hashing, let's talk after the presentation, please. I have some very sad news for you. <laughs> so, we are going to be using this OpenSSL binary. We're going to have, uh, I think I missed a part here. We're going to have major sections of our configuration file that are, are related to commands we can run within OpenSSL. Inside those sections, they could refer to some other sections. Sometimes the presence or absence of a referral to a different section is enough to trigger some off over here functionality that you actually care about. Uh, I'm going to stop talking about all of the difficulties and just show it to you. You'll see what I mean. I have the root hidden in a very secure place here and a hidden directory in my home directory. No one will ever know. Oops. 
Okay. How long is this? That's 330 lines of anger. <laughs> My anger, not this. So, let's go down to something useful here. This, can you guys see my, no you can't, okay. So I'm just gonna put this at the very top of the page. This section in the top line there is just CA. This is a command that we run as a certificate authority when we want to sign another certificate. So everything inside this section, which there's only one item, relates to behavior for that. And for some reason they added a little redirection step here. So. I am designating a new configuration section called self 2014, which I will use for all of my certificate authority activities. Inside this configuration file, it looks like this. And it's everywhere. We have items for where's the directory that the certificate authority files are stored. I should mention, all of this is just done with simple files. It's really quite amazing how simple the system is. You're spending millions upon millions or billions of dollars a year on a system that's just a couple files and bits moved around here and there. It's amazing. Anyway, we have a bunch of uh, files in here that are being used by OpenSSL to track what certificates we have issued, such as this uh, certs option. And then where do we put new certificates that we've created? Uh, certificate revocation. Um, we count up numerically for however many certificate revocations we've issued. So I start with one, two, three, four. We need to be able to keep track of what that number is. It stores that number in a file. What file is it in? Well, it's in the CR, CRL number file. And where should we keep the existing uh, content revocation list? Well, in the option CRL. That's pretty straightforward. How about let's skip down to, ah, here we go, extensions. So when we run, a, when we sign a certificate, we are going to add some things to that certificate. We are designating a new configuration section called user underscore cert. Yes, sorry. Oops, that was too much. Sorry. Stopping right there. The second to top, no, that's not it. There we go. X509 underscore extensions equals user underscore cert. That is shorthand for we're defining a new configuration section called user underscore cert. Let's go check that out. Here we go. As you can see, all sections are defined by these brackets with spaces. You can actually create arbitrary sections in the configuration file. It will really make you wonder about your sanity when you come back three months later and you look at your configuration file. What was I doing here? Like I've done that a lot with Perl code and with OpenSSL configurations. So here we're going to go through some basic items here. Uh, I am looking, showing you the configuration file for a root signing certificate. In a typical configuration, that comment, right, that line is uncommented, which says that whatever we're signing, we're not going to allow it to be a certificate. In fact, we're going to specifically set that flag to false. Now, there is no question that this certificate cannot be used as a certificate authority. But since this is a root and we're signing intermediates, I need to take that out. Let's see what else there is. I have commented out a bunch of information in here. Some of this is vestigial, this NS cert type, NS what, whatever. That's all from the old battle days of Netscape when you know, OpenSSL was not even birthed yet, I believe, and SSL, it was, it was the dark ages of SSL, shall we say. Different, um, different organizations, different software, they all happened differently, and so OpenSSL initially tried to cater to all those differences. Nowadays, you kind of want to keep all that junk out because we're all using the same libraries, they're all using the same formats. So here's an important little bit here. You saw this, it flew by as we were looking at a certificate, uh, the subject key identifier and authority key identifier. This is a way of saying, it's a quick way of referring to the certificate, this particular certificate, which is in the subject key, and the parent certificate, which is in the authority key. There's an interesting thing that happens. The default is this line 198. You guys see that? Line 198 is the default. 
it uses a combined key ID and issuer string. Well, what happens if I reissue an intermediate certificate because of something happening? That invalidates all the certificates underneath it. But if I'm only using the key ID, that doesn't invalidate all the certificates underneath it. We're getting a little far field. We're somewhere around line 200 of a 330 file, line file. I have put a copy of this out there on the web. You guys may peruse it at your leisure. You will spend hours doing so if you actually get into it. And you know, it's unfortunate that almost every single item in here, you have to know exactly what it is, what it does, and what it should be set to for your particular use case. It's part of the pain of becoming a certificate authority. Let's see what else is in here. That was just four hours in the config file, and that's actually a really good time. I spent four hours alone last night trying to fix a bug in uh, the self-signed CA here. So when you go into this, go into it with eyes open, this is going to be hard. We did warn you at the very beginning, this is hard stuff. And this configuration file is a large reason why. We're going to dive out of here. What did I change? We're not, whatever it is I did, I'm not changing it. Okay, let's come back into here. There we go. We already talked briefly about the basic constraints item in the certificate. Um, the actual item in the configuration file where you would set this is called basic constraints. Let's go look at that real quick. Here we have, there we go. This is down this is the section where I would be signing an intermediate certificates file. I am setting by hand, actually, no, hang on a second. What section am I in? Ah. This is another problem with the configuration file. There's lots of repetition of the same objects. It's depending on how you invoke OpenSSL. So I can invoke it to create a self-signed certificate. I can invoke it to create uh, to sign another certificate, I can invoke it to create a new certificate signing request. Each of those has different behavior with different needs. And all those switches that you may flip have to be set to something different. In this particular case, this line 246 is what I set to allow my self-signed certificate to be a certificate of authority with path one one. If we go look into the intermediate, There we go. You will see line 225. We have the same thing, only this time the path link is set to zero. So that was the, these two options in both the root and intermediate certificate files. Let's send back in. No, we just discussed all that. Uh, best practices, this will save you a lot of time and headaches. For every certificate authority you're setting up, Create and, and uh, you can start with an identical configuration file if you like, but they have different needs. So you want to tailor each configuration file to the needs of that particular certificate and you want to keep those together. So when you make a change to certificate, you should update your configuration to match it. And you want to keep them separate. So if we were to do a diff between my root configuration and my intermediate configuration, you would see some differences. And that's what will define whether it's a root or intermediate certificate. We talked about this briefly earlier. Hashing, please don't settle for ND5. Please, please, please don't. Um, in fact, a couple of years ago, some very clever individuals were able to generate out of thin air their own intermediate certificate authority because they were able to break open some very poor quality uh, root authorities intermediate MD5 hashing. They were able to create their own intermediate certificate authority. And they could go and sign whatever they wanted. Yes, ma'am. Supposedly it was a proof of concept and supposedly they deleted it. Supposedly the vendor stopped using MD5 shortly after that. But I'm also pretty certain that they did not revoke all of the existing certs that they had. So there could still be some of their certs out there with MD5 on them and they're still vulnerable. So I could use an SHA-1 hashing but we're already starting to see signs that SHA-1 can be cracked open in a reasonable amount of time. 
So let's boost it up to 128 or 256. That will add some computation time to our SSL connection, but we need it to make sure we're ensuring confidentiality for our clients. That'll work. Yeah, pretty much anyone in that family, whatever size you want to go for. I was feeling ornery and did 256 on this one. Um, ah, this is an important part. I want to show you a difference between the root and the intermediate certificate or uh, configuration. Copy extensions. Here we go. There's a little feature buried into OpenSSL that says whatever. SSL extensions are added on to the certificate signing request, you can pass them on through. And in fact, that's how I made my intermediate certificate. I specified in the certificate signing request that it should be a certificate authority, that it should have a path length of zero, that it should only be used for signing certificates and revocation lists. And then I told the root to pass all this information through. What happens if you have an end user do the same thing? If you're using this value here, copy extensions equal copy, it will blindly copy all of the extensions that whatever, whatever's in that certificate signing request into the resulting cert. So you may inadvertently, accidentally, create an intermediate certificate authority if you're not careful. So for a root certificate, we leave this value alone. Go ahead and copy those extensions. We need them. For an intermediate certificate, we comment that out, and all of those extensions are just stripped out. A uh, certificate file is still produced, it just is produced without those extensions. So that's really important to note when you're you know, that's really important to note when you're going through and doing your configurations for root and intermediate. And if you start issuing certificates to end users. And we talked about the authority key identifier. Uh, I think we're starting to get low on time, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip over that. You can Google that particular option. There's a couple of different articles that excellently explain why you want it to be set one versus the other. Let's talk about revocation lists. As a certificate authority, you have a duty to maintain them. If you are wanting your trust, then you have to be able to tell people, I don't trust this certificate anymore. The old style, oh, not all certificates are revoked for bad reasons. Sometimes a client needs to add another domain name into their subject alternate names field. They want to revoke the existing certificate and reissue it with the new settings. That's fine. That just means you have to track that revoked certificate. The certificate revocation list has to be publicly accessible or else it's not useful. If you have a private CRL, no one else can check to see if the certificate's been revoked. So it has to be publicly available. And because we're creating root certificates and intermediate certificates that last for 20 years, we need to make sure that the URL we assign for this certificate revocation list is going to last. In modern times, URLs, they don't stick around for very long. Link rot is a very real problem. We're having problems recovering data from 1999 to 2004 because all those, a lot of those domains are just gone or have changed. So one of the things about your revocation list, you are making an ironclad promise that for the length of time that this certificate exists, this URL will be valid for a certificate revocation list. And that's a big promise to make for a long period of time. We have run into some problems with certificate revocation lists. Think about 20 years. Think about even if you're only revoking a couple of certificates per day or month or however many, what volume you have. You start revoking enough, you get a very long list. I randomly pulled GoDaddy's revocation list last night for their root certificate, or one of their most popular intermediate certificates, it was six megabytes long, and that's very compressed digital data. They have tons and tons of revocation. So that means you have to store that, and that means anytime someone goes out to check the revocation list, they have to read through six megabytes worth of data to find maybe that the certificate they're checking is in there. As the revocation lists get larger and larger, everything gets slower. So we've invented another method of doing this called OCSP, which for some reason, that acronym escapes me what it means. Online Certificate Status Protocol. Thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> Online Certificate Status Protocol. It's basically, sir, question. What's about the certificate rotation list? Mm -hmm. Are they also adding to the rotation list the certificate that they have just expired, or is that considered a separate mechanism? 
That's a separate mechanism. Once they expire, naturally there's no need to keep track of them anymore except for historical reasons. I had a certificate granted to this person from 2003 to 2005. You might want that for continuity or whatever. I'd keep it for business records and because it's really easy to store. You don't need to revoke it. So, so that means you can also purchase out of the CRM once they expire? Yes, that's exactly right. Once they have expired naturally, you don't need the revocation anymore because the first check that happens is what's the date? Is it before or after the valid on? Is it within that date window? If it's not, we don't do anything more. Sir? But did, didn't you mention that if you could change your client computer's clock in the last talk, then you could make it re valid? That's correct. We did talk so about that. We're trying for completeness to say you revoke it so that the option is no longer. Yes. Um, I honestly don't know how the bigs handle it. I am lazy. I don't want to keep that on my CRO. If you want to set your clock back to December and relive Christmas every week, go ahead. If that keeps your cert valid, I'm not going to stop you. The other thing is keep in mind that the CRL is only good if somebody looks at it. That's exactly correct. If I am just blindly assuming that this is a good certificate and I don't bother to check, let's, let's, let's go through an example here. That will be very good. I have created, where was this? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's lost in the level of security. Yeah, so if you, if you want to set your clock spec, knock yourself out. Uh, I will stay on normal time. Sir? I, ho hopefully I'm not beating a dead horse by asking one more question on that topic. But would uh, the certificate be able to use the NTP protocol? Uh, those are two. Uh, the question was, would the certificate be able to use an NTP protocol? Those are two separate entities. The system would use NTP to keep its time, and then would, now that it knows its time is set properly, then it goes and does that with SSL. They don't have any concept of each other. Although I will state that there is SSL secured NTP transactions. So, I forget what I was going to do. What was I doing? Ah, yes, the certificate revocation example. Thank you. Let's go out to where I, Last presentation, we generated a Happy Puppies certificate. It's in part one, resources, presence. Here we go. So we have the evidence of our certificate that we created. We have the key file on the far right. We created a certificate signing request, which we then passed over to the certificate authority that I've been showing you this morning. That certificate authority signed it and returned the CRT file. This is what that certificate looks like. If you're being good and you are the software that's running through and doing the verification, one of the things you will do is go and find You'll build a hash out of who the issuer is here. It's at the top of the screen now. You'll go look for that certificate, and you want to verify that it matches this authority key identifier. In this certificate here, you are hoping that you will find a certificate revocation list. Let's go check that, shall we? Is there, do I see a hand up over here? OK. This is my intermediate certificate. Let's see. No, I did not include a CRO in this. Oops. Sorry. But what we can do, let's go out. Oh, oh, come here. Let's go, someone name a common certificate authority. Fair sign. Air sign sound good? Let's go look at one of their intermediates. Maybe. Which 
just want to look at it. There we go. Here we go. Primary intermediate certificate. I'm going to pull this down. Okay, this is the Verisign Intermediate, one of their intermediates. We see the issuer here, Class 3 Public Primary Certification Authority. Valid for 15 years. Their validity is going to be coming up soon. Subject, come down here. They have a couple interesting things. Here we go, they have OCSP. Right here, this line towards the bottom. Authority Information Access, they have OCSP. They do not have a certificate revocation list because... Oh, I did? Oh, where is it? There it is, look at that, hey! Brilliant, thank you guys for having sharper eyes than me. Let's go look at that. Where did that go? What was that called? P3 whatever? There we go. Let's see if I can remember the command to read. Uh, let's just do this. I cannot remember this command, I apologize. <coughs> Reading CRL. Yeah, there it is. It's just called CRL. Okay, so this, this is unfortunately not going very well, and I apologize for that. They have published a certificate revocation list. What we can do, that's only 933 bytes long. That doesn't seem right. I was expecting that to be pretty big. Oh well. But the uh, example hopefully is proved. They have publicly available in a well-known location a certificate revocation list. In fact, they have listed the URL in their certificate. Since you're going to be keeping the certificate for 15, 20, 30, however many years you want, that URL has to be bulletproof the entire time that you're using that certificate. It's one of the promises you make as a certificate authority. Um, OCSP is the same thing. You are leading, you're putting into your certificate, here is a link to an OCSP service. And I didn't explain what that is. As opposed to downloading the entirety of the list of all certificates that have been revoked since this, this certificate was issued, you just ask OCSP, have you revoked this certificate with this hash? And it goes and looks at its CRL and says, why, yes, I have revoked that. Well, thank you, kind sir. And it goes off and says, hey, go toddle off. We're not going to use that one. That's OCSP. That way it prevents, it, it, the client doesn't have to download a big list. It doesn't have to search through a big list. It doesn't have to work through a bunch of stuff that is actually meaningful to it, or not meaningful to it at all. It's a quick response and solves a problem that is growing as time goes on. Sir? I'm guessing that uh, using SSL to secure both protocols is pretty important. Could you repeat the question, please? I'm guessing that using SSL to secure both of those protocols is pretty important. Ironically, if you do so, what happens? How does it check that the certificate you've secured it with isn't sure. revoked? The question was. But you also need to know that the question was originally uh, that SSL would play a role in securing those, the, the URLs for the certificate revocation list and OCSP. There is a dark irony in that if you do so, if it's uh, SSL secured, how do you check that the certificate that's securing it isn't revoked? Because that's the very list you're trying to check. Sure. The OCSP so. response itself is signed. Okay. So ah, yes. Yes. Uh, so the, the comment was that the CRL is actually signed by the certificate that generated it. That's a good point. I just remembered that I got. Let's go look at that. I think I did that. No goods in the root. Somewhere around here. Ah, yes, I did. This is what the CRL file looks like. It's pretty much 
similar to a certificate file. It's encrypted, it's signed. Um, it's been encrypted with the private key of the certificate which generated the CRL. And because everybody has the public key, they can then use that information and decrypt the list. Now that's computationally expensive. We don't want to do that, but that's the only way we can ensure that this list is being published by the certificate for which the list claims to be. We don't, always, we don't ever assume that people are who they say they are. They have to prove it to us. Authenticity, authenticity is an enormous part of the SSL process. So, so if the CRL itself isn't available, the client assumes that everything's fine, or if they receive, receive no reply from this, this CRL, it, does the same exist with those in this community? Uh, the question was, if the CRL is, doesn't exist, even though there's a URL for it, but let's say that server's gone offline, um, what happens? The same thing for OCSP, what happens? And that's dependent upon the client making the request. Uh, so a client who's very security worried would say, we can't find the CRL. I don't trust this. I'm getting out of here. Other clients who want to offer a better, uh, they, they just want to kind of smooth things over may say, okay, we didn't find the CRL, so clearly we couldn't find this certificate on the CRL. That's okay. And they'll just go trot it out, whatever. It's it's client by client. There's no specific set in stone response to that. Again, that's that's done client side. I, I can't speak to it as an overarching feature of how they do it. So unfortunately. I'm guessing you don't agree with Google. Uh, how does Google do it? They don't put those at all, or at least they're not there. Oh yes, I think that's stupid, right. especially. They're, they're signing certificates for themselves only. I think um, this is Google we're talking about. They can maintain their own. OK, Chrome. Oh, that's right. We talked about this yesterday, I believe. Yes. Chrome has some oddness in the way it handles certificates that aren't valid or maybe revoked. Chrome doesn't check the CRO at all because it takes too much time. And honestly, it's a really big pain, and we don't care. It's a certificate, and it looks good to me. Let's just go on. That's Chrome. That's not me, that's Chrome. I just happen to use Chrome. Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> okay, uh, we are running low on time, so I'm going to zip ahead. Is there a plugin to mitigate that? Probably. You, you the question is, is there a plugin to mitigate that and change the Chrome behavior? Yeah. There's probably settings. If you do about config or whatever the equivalent is, you could probably change it. They're doing some whitelisting type of things at Google. Okay, whitelisting at Google. There are things, if you are concerned about this, there are research about it, and you can go look into it. I don't have that information at hand, so I can't speak to it, unfortunately. But it sounds like there's quite a few people around here that are very interested in it and can answer any questions you have. So, there's where? Also, there's also a really interesting post by Adam Lentley, who's a uh, security developer at Google, on his personal blog, imperialviolet.org. Imperialviolet.org, the blog of some guy with a name. That's a security researcher at Google. Yes, he, has, he covers uh, some provocations and why it's disabled in Chrome by default. What was it again? Uh, Imperialviolet.org. Uh, like, he has a lot of security related blog posts. So you're going to have to scroll down a little bit. Well, we don't have time to look at it. We're running low on time. So, this, I, I'm putting this up here for uh, viewers later to see that this is the page we're talking about. It's, um, according to Doug, is a great page to read up on revocation and SSL and yada, 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 all those pieces and parts and bits. We're very, very low on time. Um, in fact, I'm probably going to have to squeeze this off and ask about questions. Anybody have questions? Things that are unclear, weren't covered? Yes, sir. I think the whole reason I came to this talk and talk before is because right now I access some stuff in the cell side of SSL and it works for me, but then I got to accept the SSL and I got to get the next button. I'm not scared by it. How do you? Like, if they trust mm. me explicitly, I don't have to go through Verisign. Is there a mechanism for me just to have my own authority and then get yes. to be like, I want to go to your website and trust you. But it's already in the web browser. He doesn't have to get my certificate and install it. And, and yes. Like this, you mean? This is a certificate that I signed right. using the Monax Certificate Authority. I have accepted at the system level, the Monax Public Certificate Authority as a trusted authority. And therefore, that entire tree of trust 
the intermediate that it was generated with, the end user that I generated and signed, all of those are considered trusted by my system. So how did you get that mod into the list that your web browser is using? In OS X, it's actually quite simple. Um, let's do this. So without using Verisign, I mean, there's no way that it's a hands-off procedure that's automatically going to the browser. Correct. Without using somebody who's already in the NCA list because it's a really long and arduous process to keep yourself into the preloaded CA list, you have to go through it. They don't want just anybody creating their own certificate of authority. Anybody can. We've learned how to do it today, although we didn't get a chance to actually do it. We've learned all the pieces and parts needed. We could all make our own individual certificate of authorities. We could create certificates and throw them at each other, print them out, and have fun. The problem is, yes. Uh, Start SSL, I guess. But no matter what, I must explicitly trust somebody somewhere. That's correct. At some point, you have to extend trust to something. And there have been a lot of companies who have gone through the arduous process of proving, you can trust us. Here's our security. Here's our vault. Um, I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, the CA certs. I don't, I'm not going to touch that right now. That's, that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, your browsers individually may choose to do it one way or another. Chrome uh, uses the system here on OS 10. I don't know how it does it in Linux. I think it also uses the system. So there are ways where you can specifically choose to trust a certificate authority that you have created or someone else you trust has created. Um, those ways are dependent upon the system and the browser you're using. Do you have any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you guys for coming. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, these presentations for the last two will be online permanently at the location here, self2014.grimoire.re. Um, you can go back and refer to these at your leisure. Thanks for coming, guys. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.